have this idea for a symphony. It's a requiem for the eternal conflict of the soul on the tragic battlefield of time. Uh, it's just an idea at the moment because I can't actually play a musical instrument. I was going to learn. I had this guitar bought for my 10th birthday. Beautiful it was, handmade. It was the only thing a beauty I ever owned. And I customised it. I stenciled the word noise on it. <laughs> and, uh, then about two days later it was stolen. And I was so destroyed by that that I've never been able to touch a musical instrument since. And I've always felt that it was at that moment when the guitar was stolen that my life lost touch with destiny and I lost all sense of purpose and meaning. But tonight, David will be my hands and the symphony will course through him. Um, this what idea I've got, well, yeah. it's, uh, uh, the vision I have is these two opening chords that start off with. It's a nod towards Beethoven yeah. as I shoulder it into similar territory. Sort okay. Of, sort of... Da, da. Da, da. Yes, yes, sort of two bold clarion calls. Right. You know. Okay, what about, what about this? Yes, yes, that's it. The same, only, only this time more Sturm and Drang. More Sturm sort of... And drang. Da, da. <laughs> yes, that's it. Only, only, I don't want to be too uh, negative and depressive, yeah. okay? okay. I, I, I have this image of hope. I hope. see this woman, she's, she's tripping along the cliff tops in a light cotton skirt and there's... Thunder clouds Is that like cotton skirt lifting as she runs? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you, you failed to grasp the meaning. We are composing symphonies. You save that for Shabba Ranks. She's <laughs> <laughs> an image of hope and her skirt is down. Well, what's that, what's that? She, melodically? Melodically. Melodically, what's that? I, I see her tripping along these cliffs and she's, she's humming a, a little refrain to herself, sort of la da da, la da da, la da da. Oh, oh, that's beautiful. Oh, yes. Well, that's, that's, that's Debussy, that's... I, 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 don't, I don't want to come across the, uh, the musical professional in, uh, in this situation, but um, I think what, 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 what one would have here in an orthodox mm -hmm. classical yes, piece yes, is yes. what we call a da capo da coda, which is a, a lilting bridge, a movement down from the opening variation into the closing section. What have you got? Well, I thought, <laughs> I thought perhaps this... No, I think that's a bit too pubby. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what's in your head? My head, I don't know, I sort of... Something tentative, mm? something, something hesitant, not sure with yet whether it's reached that sort of final summation, uh, sort of... Da-da, 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 da-da. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> oh, that's, that's Chopin. That's, that's beautiful. That's... And finally. Finally. Finally, okay, I want to get, I want to echo those opening two chords, mm. that sort of, dr dr only this time it's tempered by the wisdom of experience and so it's a little bit more reflective, sort of, dr dr It sings of experience. Okay, is, is this what you want? <laughs> yes. <laughs> My symphony is complete. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen... I give you the first public performance of a requiem for the eternal conflict of the soul on the tragic battlefield of time by Robert Newman. I thank you. You've ruined it! That, that was meant to be about everything, that symphony. That was meant to be about all the tragedies I've ever suffered. You know, the lost guitar, Lucy, my white poodle that was killed by a hit and run driver, <laughs> the bicycle that I had bought. That... Shut up! <laughs> it was Olympic standard, and some lads stole it. I never saw it again, but they told me that they took it down the wreck and set fire to it. <laughs> That time I found a man's sweaty, evil Knievel t-shirt underneath Rachel's bed. Everything. And you ruined it. My symphony. You're always stopping me achieving anything. It's like, it's like you're Satan's envoy sent to destroy my life. <laughs> and I'm still Robert Smith's favourite. <laughs> 
I don't need him anyway, that loser. I've, I've, uh, I've got other ideas. Luckily, I didn't share with him. I've got this lilting one, sort of... Da, 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 sort of like that. I'm just going to just try that out. Yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah, let it flow. Here, at the North Atlantic Marine Organization, we've been researching into the migratory patterns of the North American eel. What we've discovered is that if you attach a transmitter to the eel, <laughs> and release it into the water, basically, it sinks like a stone. And if we carry on like this, soon there'll be no more North American eels. Now, there is no need for 40% of all accidents in the office. Well, there was no need for that time. Uh, uh, this should help pay for your dialysis machine. <laughs> like the other day, a friend of mine came round and, and uh, you know, I, I let her in and, and um, you know... Uh, we, had a, we had a few glasses of wine and, you know, it was all going very well. There's a nice vibe between us. And then, you know, we moved on to the coffee stage and we're still getting on very well. And then she said, uh, well, I better be getting off now. You know, have you got the number of a cab company? And I said, yeah, yeah, here's one here. Uh, yeah, here, these are very good. If you want, though, and I'm not saying this sex or anything, but you're, you're welcome to, you know, share my bed. I, mean, I, I, don't mean, I don't mean sleep together. I just mean, you know, sleep, sleep together, not, not doing anything. Just, just, yes, I mean, by all means, if you want to take a cab home, of course, I can do that. Is there... Should you so desire? And she said to me, Well, thank you, Robert. That's nice to know, but it's three o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Is it? Well, we're out of that people, that's good. And yet, ironically, we did end up doing the deed of darkness. And, and now, I hate talking about sex. You know, some comics can do it. And, and I, I hate all those programs that talk about sex, you know, like the Good Sex Guide. To me, they're so mechanical they, they take all the beauty and mystery and essential poetry out of shagging the ass off someone <laughs> it wasn't concentrating you know like like this is how out not with it i was right I, I could hear the telly on in the flat next door and i caught myself trying to work out what program it was that <laughs> right, and I'm like, this is like how not there i was there was i could hear a rag and bowman in the street outside and it because it was going oh boy this like long train of thought about how what he was originally saying was have you got any old rag and bone please <laughs> but because it was a phrase that he'd had to repeat a thousand times it had now become <laughs> anyway with all this going on and to cut a short story shorter I prematurely ejaculated and now I hate talking after sex for you know weeks but like on this <laughs> and that whole you know blame responsibility better loving ethic I hate all that and yet on this one occasion I thought you know I, I should apologise to her for the fact that I came too soon. I should just say to her, I'm sorry I came too soon. So I turned on my side, looked deep into her lovely brown eyes and said, Sorry I came! <laughs> sorry I came! I'm ill. I ache. I feel like I've gone ten rounds with Hulk Hogan or The Undertaker. But... You know, being ill, it's nothing new. As soon as you're born, you get ill. I had them all as a baby. Mumps, chicken pox, measles, syphilis. <laughs> the thing is that I was born in America, and my parents were always really unhappy about the idea of paying for medical treatment, you know. I couldn't actually go and see a doctor as such, but every so often they did let me have a go on one of those fairground pulse rate machines, <laughs> which meant that when I had pneumonia as a child, I was actually diagnosed as being hyper-horny. <laughs> and prescribed a series of cold showers. Oh, my poor darling. <laughs> Still, not long now before illnesses my whole life. Like my grandmother, 
She's a short German woman called Gertie. She's got this hearing aid, and last time I went to see her, the hearing aid started to feed back. And she just stands there smiling while it goes, Hee! <laughs> anyway, next thing I knew, there was a big roadie standing next to her, a big fat bloke in a Nirvana t shirt with his arse crack showing, going, <laughs> One, two! One, two! <laughs> Next time I saw her, she was on tour with the Jesus and Mary chain. <laughs> well, that stuff. Some candy talking. Some candy talking. Gertie! It made something clearer to me than ever. There is no dignity in old age, right? All those consolations, wisdom, peace, rest, it's all just propaganda. This is what happens. Firstly, you go bald. But your hair doesn't drop off your head, it drops through your head and comes out your nose and ears. <laughs> Our one hope is Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease, they should stop trying to cure it. Because if you're 90, the last thing you want is sanity. I mean, there you are, dribbling away, saying, I invented the banana! Right? <laughs> Happy as Larry, right? Someone cures you and it's like, oh, I can't walk and all my friends are dead. <laughs> Cheers! <laughs> and God has played so many tricks on us about growing old, you know, like the way that a Zimmer frame looks a bit like a pair of parallel bars, right? So I know how I'm going to die, 90 years old, stumbling around, and a little voice in my head's going to be saying, go on, do a backflip. <laughs> At this point, our only hope is death itself. The angel of death is an angel, after all. I'm so terribly sorry. Your father was a good man. Be strong. At least he leaves us now with great dignity and quiet repose. Ah, I think that must be the undertaker. <laughs> Watch out, Hogan! Look how bulldog you're going down in the second round! It's the undertaker! Prepare to meet thy maker! <laughs> I'm so possessed by death that I spend a lot of time fantasising about my own funeral. Sometimes I really indulge myself with it. We lay here to rest the body of David Bow Diddley. <laughs> We've been playing hard to get, and now it's too late. Oh. And to think he could have been amongst the best. <laughs> Pele, best, Maradona, crooks. Been this miserable. I always preferred him to the other one. <laughs> Who are we going to give the Nobel Prize for Literature to now? <laughs> what? See, really, is that I'll live to be 78 and then be biographised like no one before. Well, I first met David when he was a young man. Back in 1994, we had one very long summer together. 50 years ago. Oh, I treasure that time in my memory. And there's not even any real dignity or tragedy after death. We move from glory into glory. No. Not if the behaviour of poltergeist is anything to go by. I'm a poltergeist. I have all the power of the spirit world. Magic from beyond the grave. 
So what I'm going to do is knock this mug off the TV. <laughs> Ha ha ha! So evil! And it was their favourite Garfield mug as well. Oh dear, I've made a bit more mess than I intended. <laughs> I'm just gonna have to be a man, you know. I'm just gonna have to say. I'm sorry about my disgusting behaviour. I'm not normally like that. It'll never happen again. And I don't know what came over me. Sorry, behave! <laughs> Normal like I am! Yeah, all right, all right, it's fine. Don't know what came over me! Yeah, no, it, it's fine, honestly. Oh, cheers. So I just want to say, I'm, I'm sorry about, you know, what I said about you ruining my life. You know, I, I don't go around with those thoughts in my head, and, and I'd particularly like to officially retract what I said about you, you know, destroying my dreams. You know? No, that, that's, that's fine. I'm glad you've come round, actually, because um, I was just sitting here thinking about all the good times that we have had together, you know. Like when we went to Spain, oh, it was God, such a lot. Yeah. God, you forget about all those things. Jesus, yeah. I've, I've got the photos here somewhere. Have you? I, I've never seen them. Oh, you must have. No, no, no. I've got, they're here somewhere, I'm sure they're in here, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because like, I don't know if you remember, right, but do you remember being in that bar, right, in Madrid, and they had, like, bullfighting match uh, of the day on? Do you remember that? Yeah, and, like, yeah. everyone started shouting Ole, but we started the shouting of Ole, right? That was the incredible thing. We started shouting Ole. <laughs> <laughs> anyone else had even thought about it. Right? It's an amazing thing. No one else had thought about it, right? <laughs> no one... Right, and then from there on, we went to Fuengarola to see your mum. And we said, all right, to anyone. I couldn't believe anyone thought, you know, that that was like... <laughs> <laughs> was insane. Dude, it was so funny. And... <laughs> oh, it's was brilliant, it was. I'm sorry about all this uh, junk and stuff. I'm just waiting for Gentleman Jim to come round on his horse and cart and take it all away. Anyway, here they are. <laughs> I don't remember you being an evil Knievel fan. <laughs> How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? My name is Jarvis. I have been informed that tonight's programme is being watched by over seven million people, as far afield as the Netherlands and Ireland, and all over Britain, in small bedrooms on black and white portable televisions, on the communal colour televisions in Chinese takeaways, in the front rooms of Carlisle, Glasgow, Manchester and Birmingham. And the irony is, I'm not wearing any pants. <laughs> How very irresponsible. <laughs> Isn't Jarvis naughty? <laughs> Rather. I often like to put young people up. <laughs> ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Recently, I had two charming young women staying on my estate. Unfortunately, one month they both owed me 119 pounds in rent, but had no money. Isn't the economic situation terrible? <laughs> Luckily, I had a brainwave. 36 strenuous hours later, they were both in a state of near physical exhaustion. <laughs> However, the rent now stood at 118 pounds. <laughs> and I might add, my garden looked wonderful. <laughs> What sort of a man do you take me for? <laughs> mm. As time passes, I find memory and fantasy become entwined 
and lose themselves in each other. Some things, however, remain eternally clear. As I once said to Mark Almond, that's quite a thirst, young fella. <laughs> around in this room. Yes, this will leave him totally disorientated. His mind will be swimming with the anarchic force of my haywire psychic energy. Oh, I've cleared up. Good evening and welcome to History Today. I would like to take this moment to thank viewers who have stayed with us over the course of these discussions. We are under increasing pressure from the controllers who feel that we have been in some way disappointing those viewers with a yen for historical inquiry. I can only apologise and pledge that tonight both myself and Professor F.J. Lewis, Emeritus Professor of History at All Souls College, Oxford, are determined as never before to undertake a full and rigorous exposition of tonight's most exciting subject, the Doomsday Book. <laughs> the beginning of radicalism or the end of liberty. Professor Lewis. See that, Michael Bolton. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> I am aware of his work. That's your haircut, that... <laughs> You see those white plastic bracelets that mental patients wear <laughs> that say, on continuous medication, return wearer to hospital? I have observed them. That's your swatch, that is. <laughs> That's your shockproof tag wear. It is indeed a, a moot point, end of radicalism, beginning of liberty. Yes. But this is a, a twilight period of transition. can be seen in the magical significance uh, 14th century mythology attaches to things which are themselves symbols of transition. Yes. Uh, the edge of a forest. Or twilight itself, that dusk before the day has really ended, but nor can one say that it is yet early evening. Of course. And that's your bedtime, that is. <laughs> That's your bedtime on Friday nights. <laughs> You're on the front cover of Quarter Past Five Monthly. <laughs> Congratulations. The importance of the Doomsday Book as a milestone in history can be seen from the fact that it is one of only a handful of books to be kept in cryogenic suspension at the British Museum. The book is held in a sealed chamber at a set temperature of minus 273 degrees Celsius, a temperature which in modern physics is known as absolute zero. Indeed. And that's the number of pubic hairs. <laughs> <laughs> you thought you had one the other day, but then you weed through it. <laughs> You know those things that happen in the street after nine o'clock? Oh, yes, yes, very much so. Oh, so I presume you're familiar with the Viking longboat driven by Mary Peters down our street at 9.30? <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> like all ships of Nordic pagan design, yes. had a curved aft and a curved stern. Thus. Yes, I'm aware of the design. And that's how you walk down the street. <laughs> well, I don't think that anyone can be in any doubt that... Oh, hi, girls. <laughs> oh, no, quarter past five. 
that tonight uh, Professor Lewis and myself have had a most penetrating <laughs> and illuminating debate. <laughs> Professor F. J. Lewis, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. children. That's enough excitement for me. Your, your grandpa is a very, very old man. Soon, I think, I may be on my way. Don't say that, Grandpa. Hush, child. Ripeness is all. But there are some things now that I might like to pass on. I haven't opened this closet here since 1994. I came back one day and... I don't know why, on an instinct, I locked it. I thought that perhaps one day in the far, far future, I might open it. And whatever was inside would serve as a record of my life. Now, this, this belonged to my girlfriend, Emma, your grandmother. Why do we never see her, Grandpa? Well, just after your mother was born, she left me. Disappeared without a word. I never heard from her again. Oh. I don't remember <laughs> that. Oh, no, wait a minute. This belonged to my old mucker. My old comedy chum, Robert Newman. Robert Newman? Yes. Oh, I haven't seen him since... And about the same time, I think it's 1994. Look where he is now. He'd laugh to see that, I can tell you. But you see, children, death has no sting as long as you can look back upon your time and say, I have truly understood the pattern of events I call my life. What is this? <laughs> This one's hair is very similar to mine, isn't it, Grandpa? Yes, I am. 